So with that, um, I want to thank Michael Nana for uh, filling in for us for the, this week and next week while Jeff takes a, 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 a short break. So let's welcome him.
is on the Sunday after Easter, we continue with the Easter story, picking up with John's account of the events of Easter evening, the first Easter. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father is sent, has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May God have a blessing to this reading from the Holy Word. I just want to point out a, a Two, two things, or well, one thing anyway. It says the doors were locked, and yet Jesus appeared. That the inference we are made is that he just appeared without unlocking the door. So he had a resurrection body that could act in ways that a normal human body could not. That was one thing. And the other is, is that Jesus urges, he blesses all of us who have not yet seen him in the flesh, but have still believed in him. That blessing was extended beyond, beyond that day when Jesus gave it down through the ages to all of us who believe in Jesus as the resurrected Lord. Amen. Carol, will we now uh, a short reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom he killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Bless the reading of the Holy Word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have celebrated with joy the festival of our Lord's resurrection. You graciously help us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. That all God, that prayer was taken from the Lutheran Book of Worship. I invite you to remain seated as we sing yet another Easter hymn. Every Sunday is to be a celebration of the Lord's uh, resurrection.
us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. I read to you now from the Revelation to John, uh, who, which uh, I believe was, read, was written uh, by the same John who wrote the Gospel. This is, uh, most of the, the well, he has, he says it's a revelation, and uh, most of that is, is his vision or revelation from God. This is sort of a, a preamble part. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's from God and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Obviously, that was talking about Jesus, who has freed us by his blood. And this, again, is referring to Jesus as well. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. And that talks about how God is before time, through time, the end of time, Alpha and Omega, as you probably well know, are the beginning and end of the Greek alphabets. And God is from the very beginning before all creation and will be there at the end and is, is existent during all of time and throughout all. I invite you now to stand and sing with me another Easter hymn, Come Be Faithful, Raise the strain number 315, which will uh, uh, emphasize the John's uh, the less, gospel lesson from, from John 4 that, he, that uh, I read earlier.
Thursday afternoon, and I spent three and a half hours in Dearborn helping my cousin Carol continue to clean out her parents' home, which was empty for 16 and a half years until uh, my son Paul moved in in August of 2017. Since Paul moved out a year, uh, a month ago, I've been encouraging Carol to get the house ready to sell and finally part with more of her parents' things. So Thursday afternoon, she said goodbye to her mom's blue and white candy striper or nursing outfit with two still starched white aprons, her mom's long green, green satin gown or slip, which she probably wore on her honeymoon, and, Carol, and other things. And Carol also decided to give her away her rabbit winter fur muff with a matching little rabbit, white rabbit and curry hair hat, and, and her Girl Scout uniform from the 1950s, and her orange wool sweater from Dearborn High, and et cetera, et cetera. All the clothes that she agreed to donate went into my car on Thursday night and then into my trash on Friday morning. <laughs> or they were mildewed, moth-eating, moth-eating, and a few that weren't were smelling of decades of being in a basement that had water issues. It's a shame many of the clothes and those other items weren't donated before they became garbage, but ultimately, we will all have to leave our precious possessions behind us for someone else to sort through and use or donate or destroy. Nevertheless, because of Easter, we know that after our own bodies fail and we die and leave some of our and, and leave all of our precious things before that behind us, that we ourselves will live again. More importantly, the Bible teaches that if we have faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we will live again in heaven with God and His Son and the Holy Spirit eternally. In the revelation to John, John calls Jesus Christ the faithful witness and the firstborn from the dead. You see, Jesus Christ was the first to be raised from the dead to live eternally. And we, we could argue about Elijah and Enoch elsewhere, but... Paul calls him the firstborn from the dead. And as he explains in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus will certainly not be the last. In that chapter, Paul was arguing with people who had claimed that there is no resurrection of the dead. But Paul tells in verses 17 through 19 of that chapter, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Are lost. In other words, those who, who died being Christians are, are not saved if Christ was not raised. Paul continues, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, are of all people most to be pitied. But then the Apostle Paul continues his argument by strongly asserting, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For since death came through through a man, the resurrection from of the dead also came through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So, my friends, whether we have to wait until Christ comes again to be raised from the dead to life, or whether we can be with Jesus immediate, immediately in heaven after we die, as some other scripture seems to point to, the promise of scripture is that Jesus Christ is not the only one to be raised from the dead into eternal life, just the first. The Apostle Paul had both seen and heard the risen Christ in a vision, but as you know from today's gospel lessons and last week's and others, it was Jesus' first disciples, both male and female, who saw him alive again on that first Easter day and evening. John's gospel tells us that the male disciples, minus time, Thomas, saw Jesus alive again in the evening. And at that time, according to John, Jesus gifted them with the Holy Spirit personally by literally breathing on them. Alternatively, Luke's gospel.
gospel gives us a very different story with the Holy Spirit being dispersed in what looked like flames of fire uh, that came to rest on the disciples at Pentecost of 40, 50 days or so after the resurrection. I would say that what matters is that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ's disciples receive that empowered gift of the Holy Spirit rather than just how or when they received it. Recall that John the Baptist did say at the beginning of John's Gospel that the coming Messiah, Jesus, would baptize his disciples with fire and with the Holy Spirit. So in today's Gospel lesson from John chapter 20, we see that promise fulfilled on that evening of the first Easter. Uh, of course, that story would just be another this account of historical interest if it, was, if it wasn't for the fact that we too, as believers in Jesus Christ, can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friends, if we believe in Jesus as the Son of God and our risen Lord without having to see him in the flesh in person like Thomas said he needed to do before he would believe in Christ's resurrection from the dead, then we too will receive the Holy Spirit to teach us, to remind us about what Jesus taught, to guide us, and to empower us to serve Jesus Christ. Furthermore, as I've said before in past years, I'll say again, the gospel writers, if the, if the gospel writers were making stuff up about the events of that first Easter, they would never have included all those unflattering details about how even how even Jesus Christ's closest disciples had trouble believing in his resurrection from the dead at first even though he repeatedly promised that he would die and then be raised from the dead on the third day. In fact, it took all of, of Christ's main disciples, both male and female, actually seeing Jesus alive again for them to believe in his bodily resurrection. But thankfully, they did believe in it after seeing him. And after the gift of the Holy Spirit, they were able to be very bold witnesses to the fact of Christ being raised from the dead. They also courageously shared the wonderful promise that through believing in Jesus as the Messiah, as the risen Lord and Savior, that it was possible for us to have life in his name, life in Christ's name. That good news included the fact that we can and will have all our sins forgiven by grace through faith in Christ if we read Read our sins, if we repent of them, say we're sorry to God, and place our faith in Jesus as the Messiah and as the Son of God. But I think to have life in Christ's name means more than just having our sins forgiven. It also means that Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, will give us his Holy Spirit to live in us so that we can think and speak and act in ways that ideally are more and more pleasing to God over time, that we would grow in the faith and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that our, our words and our actions and yes, even our thoughts would reflect that more. In the Revelation to John, John, the Gospel writer and the, the author of that book, strongly asserts that Jesus loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. Priests. Folks, in the Old Testament, it was only the, it was only the members of the tribe of Levi, or descendants of Eric, who could be priests. But in the New Testament, we find this idea, this radical notion of the priesthood of all believers, that we're all to be priests, in a sense. Through faith in Jesus Christ and, and through him, each one of us has direct access to God the Father. You don't need to have a priest or a minister to pray to God on your behalf, although uh, they can and will, you know, and that's you know part of what we should be doing if we are if we are clergy folk. After all, but but you don't need that because after all, as Hebrews chapter four verse fourteen through sixteen states. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest, and he's talking about Jesus. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And of course, it was not just the Jews who could be part of this priesthood of all believers and included in the kingdom of God. But as the revelation of John makes abundantly clear, anyone or everyone of any nation or race or tribe who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The revelation in John chapter 1 also asserts that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth and teaches that we are to be part of his kingdom as, as Christian believers, priests serving Jesus as God and Father, who Jesus told us in the gospel, or I should say told Mary at the tomb, as we read last week, last week that, if, that God is our Father and God as well. And friends, what a, what a privilege and responsibility that is, it, that is in in our life here and now. As part of the priesthood of all believers, part of our responsibility is to praise and worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And another part of our responsibility is to be witnesses to the good news of the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus Christ was a faithful witness in sharing all the things that God told him to share, we are to be faithful witnesses to share all the good news of peace with God and forgiveness of sins available to all persons by means of grace through faith in Jesus Christ, as well as to share all the other things that Jesus taught that we can read about in the Gospels. Know that when Jesus appeared on that first evening, Easter evening, and said to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus wasn't just talking to the ten fearful men who were there that night behind closed doors, afraid of the Jews. No, Jesus was talking to us too, today, through his living and active work. And Christ's resurrection, and, and after Christ's resurrection appearances, those fearful disciples became bold witnesses to Christ's death and resurrection, and bold sharers of the gospel, even after the same Jewish high priest and Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, that had sought the death of Jesus and obtained it through Roman hands, called them to shut up too. Peter and John had already been arrested by the Sanhedrin for healing a man from, who was lame from birth in the power and in the name of Jesus Christ. That was in Acts chapter 3. At that time, they had already courageously told the high priest and the council, Jesus is the one that referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, they said. There is no other name in all heaven for people to call on to save them. That is what they told the Sanhedrin, the same people that had sought Jesus' death. At that time, just after Pentecost, the, the council had threatened Peter and John and told them not to speak or teach about Jesus again, but they and the other apostles ignored the Sanhedrin's commands and continued teaching and preaching in the temple in Jerusalem, as well as performing many wonders and miracles in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ. So here in the passage that Carol read from Acts chapter 5, here before that, they had already been arrested before that passage. They had already been arrested again, put in jail. But God had sent his, age, his angel to open the gates of the jail and free them from behind the locked doors. And, and 
when the, the Sanhedrin, when the high priest sent for them, they were no longer in jail, but someone told them, guess what? They're back at the temple preaching and teaching. And so the high priest sent his temple guards to arrest them again at the temple. And it was after this second arrest that Peter and his, and his apostles defiantly declared to the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than human authority. In other words, they would continue to teach and preach and do wonders and miracles in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ, and nothing would shut them up but death. My friends, God's law is to be our highest authority too. As Christians, we should not be ashamed to speak or to act on behalf of Jesus Christ, whom God himself has honored at his right hand as Prince and Savior. Human laws, as we well know, do not always follow God's laws, and when we break them to obey God, let us do so and be willing to suffer for our faith. In conclusion, as you well know, none of our stuff, none of our accumulated wealth or possessions can save us when it comes our time to die. And not even our beloved friends and families can save us from death if our time is up due to old age or illness or persecution or natural disaster or whatever it is that brings us to the time when our physical life will end on this earth. Jesus Christ is the only one who can raise us to eternal life. It is by his blood shed on the cross that frees us from our sins and makes that resurrection to life in heaven with, it, with him possible. It is Christ's Holy Spirit that can empower us to be his strong witnesses in word and deed before our time to leave this earth arrives. It is Jesus alone who can give us peace with God, even <coughs> in the face of impending death. Admittedly, at times like these, it is hard to think about Jesus' gift of peace to his church when if we turn on the news any night, we can see, or see and hear terrible pictures of the war in the Ukraine or here of other acts of violence both here and abroad. Again, I'm sure that we all long for worldwide, for worldwide peace and an end to all the killings and rapes and destruction and, and the violence that pervades too much of this world. And we also long for more than just the, we, we indeed long for more than just the, the inner and spiritual peace and blessing that if we, that, that, that we can have with Jesus Christ, knowing that, that if we leave this world, that there is yet life beyond this. We long for Christ to rule the kings of this earth in such a way on this earth that it becomes more the, the peaceable kingdom that, that God originally intended it to be and created it to be. But it seems that that is going to happen. Sooner rather than later, we also need to do our part. We can't just stand behind the closed, the, the closed or, or even open doors of this church or, or the doors of our own homes. We need to step up step out to serve and to share and to speak and to say I believe in Jesus Christ as my living Lord and God and I am committed to living in a way that brings God and Christ glory and honor and praise my friends I don't want to be among those who are wailing and weeping in terror when Jesus comes again to, in glory to to judge the world and bring in the kingdom in all its fullness. I want to be rejoicing. What about you? So that we all may rejoice. May God in his mercy give us the fullness of his Holy Spirit so that we can truly be kingdom people, expanding the rule and the reign of God in our own hearts and homes, and even
even into the ends of the earth, onto the ends of the earth itself. Amen, and may glory and praise be to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you now to stand and sing in celebration of Christ our King, crown him with many crowns, number 327.
We pray for all those who are in need of your healing blessing. We lift up Sue and pray that you would guide the surgeon's hands on Friday for whatever surgeries that, that she is going to have and that things might go smoothly and well and it might be a, a, a successful operation and that she recovers swiftly. We pray that you would be with all those who are sick and in need of your healing, whether of mind or body or spirit. We lift up all those on our prayer list as well as all those persons that we lift silently in our hearts now who are in need of your healing blessing, including those ways in which we ourselves need your, your healing and your help. There are so many that are struggling and hurting, that are poor and hungry and homeless, that are refugees fleeing violence. We pray for your divine help and assistance for them, and we pray also that you might make abundantly clear to us what part we are to play as your followers in, in meeting the needs of those close by as well as those far away. We pray, Lord, for also for all those who are struggling with addictions, that you might liberate them and free them so that they might be able to experience the abundant life you came for all, that, that all of us might enjoy. We lift up these and our other joys and concerns and pray that you guide us day by day. And pray now in the words which Jesus taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is thy kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, and now uh, Carol will lead us in yet another of her beautiful prayers. First of all, a note of uh, gratefulness that uh, Debbie and Jack have come home to Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> the offering play is uh, waiting at the back pew. We gather to pray today because the stone was rolled away. With that miracle, it was prophesied the world would learn of the sacrifice of a new leader and savior who brought God's word into flesh. We are blessed to be learning and living his commands. It is our task to love our brother and support the church with our time and tithes. We all look alike from a distance, but Jesus looks inside to see our heart and soul. May he always find us worthy of his unending love and grace. Bless, preserve, comfort, and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. 